Oh God. <laughs> what, is, what is going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's the Ring Psychology Podcast coming to you from Zoom. Get putting this on YouTube. It's the twentieth episode. Nick feeling himself a little bit over there, checking his yeah. hair. <laughs> I've never been so ready for the camera in my life. Uh, welcome, I'm JP. Alongside me, as always, Bill the Thrill. The, the was it the pastor of professional <laughs> wrestling? Pastor of pro wrestling. <laughs> you know, I'm ready to go to church, sir. And then below us here is, of course, the almighty Big Nick. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm glad you all came to my fellow humble abode. I'm going to give you a tour. So that is a photo. Oh, jeez. That's my closet. That's a that, perfect photo for the company. That is a window. Here I am. This goofy shirt I'm wearing. I don't got that you much. Look, you look like you belong in that photo. He is a lone wolf. Those wolves are staring at me because they know I fit into their hibernation. <laughs> Those wolves are staring at you because they've seen things that no man should see. Oh, Jesus Christ. They haven't seen it. <laughs> you had to pull it there, didn't you? That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, for a while. We're only, what, a minute in already? <laughs> we're getting views, people. We're getting views. Oh. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 20th episode. It's only fitting that for another uh, miles, I guess for our, would this be considered the second season? Mm -hmm. Season one was the first 10 episodes. Season two is the next 10, I guess. It's up to you, my sure. I think we're just going to keep it season two, season one. I don't know how the hell we're going to be building this from here on out. But nonetheless, it's the first episode that we are going to be putting on youtube which is exciting for us because it's just another platform for us to be putting content on uh first things first today um it's been an interesting uh kind of crazy week when it comes to uh deaths in professional wrestling um normally you would think in certain situations when you see a professional wrestler pass away they're either, you know, came down from a sickness or, uh, you know, old age, you know, just been around a long time. Uh, it's very rare and always humbling, I guess, sometimes in perspective every time it does happen. But uh, two uh, members of the professional wrestling community passed away uh, this week. Um, Yesterday was uh, Hannah Kimura. She's the 22-year-old professional wrestling Japanese star for stardom. Um, according to the Twitter of uh, everywhere, pretty much, um, she was an inspiration to a lot of people. She was uh, kind of like... Um, uh, what's her name? Didn't start off as young, but she, I believe she started when she was 15, 16 years old, but 22 years old, uh, that's way too young, obviously, a promising yeah. career. Um, a, she had done a, a dark match for AEW, um, so it, she obviously had a very promising future. Um, so rest in peace to her and as well, uh, another name, but circumstances were different in how the passing happened, but, uh, Shad Gaspard, uh, formerly from, uh, Crime Time, uh, him and JTG were a tag team, uh, what, about 10 years ago, almost. Yeah. almost no, they haven't been on television in quite a while tag teaming with John Cena and everything, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, it was found out that he and his son were out in Venice Beach uh, when they both got swept out by a riptide. Uh, rescuers got there in time. Shad told the rescuers, because they got to him first, They told he told the rescuers to get his son. So they got the son. 
they didn't get Chad. He got swept away and his body went missing for three days. And uh, they had found his body washed up ashore on Wednesday. So, I mean, when you think about shock, and it, it's a little messed up to kind of think this way, but when you see two in one week, things always come in threes. Uh, I mean, I hope it doesn't happen at least anytime soon, but I mean, it's just, it's pretty crazy. I mean, Shad just, who would have thought? The dude, I think he was doing MMA at one point. Shad Gasper. Yeah, I've seen a few pictures of him. He's got like the MMA gloves and doing, I was like, huh. I didn't even know that Shad did MMA, but yeah, here in the, uh, about him and then his uh, reactions from when Kofi won the title. Um, when those surfaced after that, that was, you know, an emotional thing to watch, knowing the circumstances, you know, he basically saved his son. He, yeah. he chose his son over his own life. You know, that's uh, heroic and self-sacrificial if there ever is one, you know, so. He was in a bunch of TV shows. Huh? He was in a few movies and TV shows. He was a stuntman for the last Birds of Prey movie. Huh. For the Harley Quinn one? Yeah. They keep changing uh -huh. the title. So it went from Harley Quinn to Birds of Prey to Harley Quinn and the Birds and the Prey. Prey and the Birds. <laughs> it's a working title through yeah. all the trailers. <laughs> she, was in, she was in Sharknado as Muhammad Ali. Really? He was yeah. in Sharknado? As Muhammad Ali. Wow. 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 What a, <laughs> what a performance. <laughs> Wait, so you, you mean to tell me he was pulling that big Sharknado money? Well, wow, that's that's not bad. It's not. I mean, it's Sharknado. Still high Sharknado. Oh, wow. Well. If that means anything. Like he had a budget of $3 million, so he definitely wasn't getting a lot of money, but he was getting a dollar or two. Jeez. Wow. Thoughts and prayers go out to them, uh, to Shad Gaspar, to um, Hannah Kimura. Rest in peace, you guys. And uh, take care in the app for life. Yeah. A lot, a lot better than down here at the moment. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. But yeah. Stranger and stranger. Yeah. Give it a quick moment of silence for the two. And getting into the serious side of the show now, let's not cry the entire time. Let's make happy. Let's give people something to smile about and look forward to. It is Saturday, May 23rd. And you know what that means? AEW Double or Nothing is on today, and boy, am I excited. Ah, I've always loved what AEW does. I can't wait to see what the, the stadium brawl between the inner circle and the elite. That's going to be good to watch. Uh, Jesus Christ. Nick, you got the match card right in front of you. What, what do we have coming up for this whole card? Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we're starting off pretty strong with a triple threat match. Oh, wait. Nope. Sorry. That's a singles match. It just has Tulsi, Tully Black card as the a manager for Sean Spears going up against Dustin Rhodes in a singles match. Who do we have for that, gentlemen? <laughs> I would think it's Sean Spears who goes over now. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. I think Sean Spears goes over here. I'm going to go with Dustin because you guys said the other guy. There you go. I think what's that's over, great. That's great the theorizing and conclusion I'm coming to. What's the over-under on Dustin bleeding? <laughs> mm, I'm going to give, uh, give it like a 2 out of 10 chance. 
a two out of ten chance. Yeah, because there's no over under. I can't think of an over under for this. Over under would be how long the match goes, type of thing. But there's, um, yeah. Well, I think it's almost guaranteed <laughs> he's gonna bleed at some point during this match. Mm, I'm giving it to him. when, but it's probably gonna happen. <laughs> what else we got, Nick? We have for the number one contenders match for the tag team titles, Private Party and Best Friends. Mm. I like that. Anything with Private Party, really, I can enjoy. Best Friends, I enjoy everything that they do. It's always great. Uh, I think Best Friends go over here. Because they're in kind of a storyline when it with like Ray Phoenix and Penta and all them, so I I would think best friends go over here. Bill, I I think uh, I think it's private party. They haven't been around for a while and they've been kind of missing in action, and I think it's probably going to uh, be some kind of um, interference by the uh, the death triad. I think it's uh, and, and that's gonna and that's gonna take that that'll take that feud into wherever they want to go with the three on three. That should be a working title on itself. That death triangle name, God. Yeah, yeah, death triangle. That's right. I love yeah. the team. The name is. You're missing the name. You're missing yeah. the name. It sounds like a, it sounds like a European uh, black metal band. Death triangle. <laughs> That should be our name. <laughs> the Death Triangle yes. The Death Triangle. Uh, what do you think, Nick? I'm going to break the tie between the two of you. I'm going to go with a double count out. A double oh. count out? A double count out. Or some sort I, of disqualification? No, I'm just going to go with a count out. Count out. Wow. Yeah, because you know why? Wow. I'm losing in the in the prediction poll, so I'm gonna make a bold decision wow. every time. And this is I'm where you make a bold decision. I'm big bold Nick. This is one. <laughs> this is where you want to make that bold decision, huh? This is where I'm gonna become the next Stephen A. Smith of professional wrestling. He's flexing. He's flexing, people. Look out. The next Stephen. <laughs> oh, look at those pythons. <laughs> I don't know if vitamins, that, guys, vitamin D. I don't know if that's what you want. Stephen A. Smith, a professional wrestler. Oh, I don't oh want to. Well, he gets a lot of money just to rant all the time. He will be Skip Bayless. Like, mm, they're the same person, basically, except for one's black and one's white. <laughs> they're the ones. They're the same person. Pretty much. That's pretty. That that's pretty true. To be completely honest. What do we all got right. next, Nick? <laughs> Next card on the match, we got Chris Statin, Statin, Statlander. That's Next card one. on the match, you heard that Next too. Next card on the match. <laughs> Next card. Damn it. Next card on the This is horrible. Next <laughs> match on the card is Chris Statlander versus Penelope Ford. Hmm. Statlander. Statlander. Statlander goes over for sure. We go with yeah. Ford. You just don't want to win predictions. He doesn't That's want to win. He doesn't want the belt. Predictions, guys. Every he doesn't team, look. Win. Our predictions have always have the last two pair reviews have been the other way around. So I'm going to change it up. I'm going to go the other way around. <laughs> with all the path worth taking, and that is opposite. Hey, watch. He's going to come out of this with. We are right. Totally winning everything. <laughs> I'm 0 for two right now, guys. I need to. Oh my. <laughs> You gotta change it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm the champ. Give me my belt. We gotta get Give him. me my belt. I am gonna be the heel predictor of everything. <laughs> so after that one, what else we got? We got Nyla Rose versus Hikaru Shida in a no disqualification and no counter match, which is basically a street fight or a no holds barred, whatever you wanna call it, for the women's world title. Hmm. I'm not saying anything until you guys do, because that helps me decide. <laughs> um, hmm. Nyla Rose. They're not taking an offer yet. Josh. 
Yeah, no, I, I don't I don't see him taking it off her just yet. And if it was going to be somebody, I don't think it would be Sheeta. Right. Like, Sheeta is really good. I don't think it would be her that's going to take it off of Nyla. Hey, did you guys hear that report last night about Britt Baker? Yeah. She yeah. Might, I didn't catch that. What happened? She needs an appointment, and it's not for some dental work. No, she might be out six to eight months or saying. Oh, shit. Yeah. Toward ACL. Yeah, pretty messed up. Oh, killer. Yeah. Just when the women's division was maybe going somewhere. It still could. It still could. I know who they need to call, guys. There's a free agent in the market right now. She's, She's one phone call away. That's seen Tina Morella, guys. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, yeah. Talk about yes. the women's division. Yes. We need a yes. trans character. Yes, yes, yes. We already have a trans character. Well. Yeah, you have a, a strong trans trans. Uh, another trans character. character that we actually know, and its name is Santina Morella. Oh, my God. <laughs> what the hell? That didn't even make any sense. So, anyway... Uh, who you pick in there, Big Nick? We go Sheeta. All right. Well, I can't go. I can't go by disqualification. <laughs> just go going up. What happened? It's after that one. Next on the card is MJF versus Jungle Boy. Wow. Jungle Boy. Hmm. I'm a Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy were to win this, this would be a big upset. I, I agree. I agree. And I just I think there's I think there's some kind of lost momentum with Jay uh with um uh who yeah. who's in <laughs> yeah. MGF. MGF. I think there's a little bit of lost momentum since he wasn't be able he wasn't able to be at tapings for a while. I think he's getting to be going over. They're gonna give him a little bit of more of a push. They kind of, I think, I think they dropped the ball a little bit, or for whatever reason, like I said, if he couldn't have been there or not. But uh, I, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm going for. MJF for the win. Nick, we go with Jungle Boy by disqualification because MJF's gonna beat the hell out of Jungle Boy. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Chair. Probably. The nice chair. What? Probably rectangulish. Rectangulish. Yes. All right. Next card in the match is Cody versus Lance Archer for the inaugural AEW TNT title. Archer. Hmm. On a side note, you know what I'd really like? A TBS title. Title? <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a, a TBS. funny title. Can you imagine how stupid a TBS title would look? Yeah. I'm going with Cody. Cody? Yeah, I'm going with Cody. Right. And I think maybe I think maybe Lance Archer ends up in that ladder match for the for the chance at the TNT title after after uh He's that mystery guy. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. We'll see. I don't know. I'm going with Cody though, either way. You should put a prediction on who the mystery person is. Oh yeah, true. That's a good call. I was gonna say who's being cut by WWE right now that isn't in that match. <laughs> right. Or who yeah, whose ninety days over uh I don't know. Oh maybe uh, yeah. I'm gonna go Archer because I think they're gonna keep on with that whole story of Cody not being able to win the big one type of thing. He wasn't able to do it in WWE, now he's not able to do it here. That kind of I think that's what they're gonna long-term storytelling. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I just think that then they'll have to some. They'll probably have to turn a heel at least, or at least a uh, version of a heel to get. You know, if he gets angry and frustrated that he can't win the big one, then he's going to just go all off rails. Absolutely. He may yeah. just leave the company. Wow. Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. Just take off. Just said, screw it. I can't <laughs> win the company. I'm gonna darn <laughs> title the company I created. I yeah, know. right. I'm gonna go to Impact. Oh, Ring of Honor. Yeah, you go back to where you got some respect. Uh, but no, I think they're gonna continue that storyline. And Archer's a pretty, pretty damn good wrestler. He's got a pretty good character going right now too. So I think they're gonna give it to him. 
my own, my only caveat to that is that uh, you're talking about the very first TNT champion, and I think that might be Cody. Now he may not keep him very right long if Lance Archer gets a hold of him in a rematch, but I think that I mean the first TNT champion, and Cody's kind of the I, I, I don't know. That's just I, that was my first impression. So we'll see. I mean, you would think that. You would. AEW is very good at being able to kind of be at least a little bit unpredictable in what they're going to do. That's true. And I do like that. They're not Jeff Jarrett. Well, keep <laughs> Jeff Jarrett out of AEW, goddammit. No, I'm saying if this was Jeff Jarrett's company, he'd be champion right away, five times in a row, until the company just overfloated. Well, thank God it isn't. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to say the winner is Lance Archer. I'm going to just go with the storyline that Cody's just not going to win a title and then he's going to leave and go somewhere else. <laughs> I like it. I think he'll sign with WWE. Yeah. 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 yeah that makes sense. I he's like going to go back and get his job back. Right. He's going to be Stardust. There we go. Oh, my God. Oh, it's like, I'm sorry for leaving, guys. Give me back the suit. Talking about burying somebody again. Jeez. He'll be burying himself. Yeah, but why would you want to do that after basically revitalizing your career? He got tired of it. Oh, he got tired of being good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next card or next match on the card is John Moxley versus Brody Lee for this uh, AEW World Title. Man, oh man, Mox. Can I just say real quick? I I'm going to say a very unpopular opinion here, but Brody Lee doesn't do it for me. I don't know why it just doesn't that the, the whole thing the build up when they, when they revealed him I was I was hyped I just don't I don't get I don't get that whole thing right now it just doesn't feel very natural and fluid and then it's like where's U, U, Evil Uno and the other dude they're like just totally disappeared I just I don't know it's something doesn't that doesn't feel right I can see why Matt Hardy wouldn't have wanted to be that character he didn't want to he didn't want to be he didn't want to be the exalted one because it just seems like it's just kind of not really gone anywhere. But we'll see. If he gets the belt, then whatever. But I think it's definitely Mox getting it. Do you need a Rowan? <sighs> Is that just too obvious, though? Do you need a Wyatt, a Strowman, or an Orton? What, what do you need? What do you, what do you want me to throw you, a bone? <laughs> I don't know. Do you think, do you think that gimmick and storyline is working right now? I don't. I don't feel it. I just don't. They're I just don't. It really hard, man. They're hitting oh, me with that shit to like it. Oh, oh yeah. No, no, no. They want us to like it. I just. I don't know. You know. You might. You want the most unpopular opinion here. I'm going to say it. I don't think that that dude's got it. I don't I'm, think he's got it. I think it's, right now. It's, you got to tweet that. I think right Tyson now. does not think Brody Lee has it. A little bit more. I think talking wise, he's not bad. It's just the direction of where things are going. I think they probably put him up against Mox a little too early. Too soon, yes. And with the whole basically taking the self-proclaimed aid, eh, they might and, have. Uh, well, yeah, and I think the other thing, too, is what you just said. He's not bad, but you kind of built this guy up to be this, you know, he's taking people who are losing and can't win, and he's, he's building this cult. And then he comes in, and he's not bad on the mic. He's not bad with his promos. And I think you're, you're probably looking for a home run, not just a double. Do you understand what I'm saying? You wanted a home run. You wanted that guy to come in and, and, and hit a home run, not just a, a, you know, a stand-up double. And what I, have Brody Lee hit in baseball terms? Has he hit a triple for you at least? You want that character. You want, you want the exalted one when he came in to hit a home run. Well, as, he was as supposed, much as they built it up, yeah, it kind of. Well, and my thing too is it was a whole about you know you're you're losing, don't be a loser. And then here comes Brody Lee, and all he does is just call everybody losers and treat them like they're losers. It's kind of counter counter 
counter uh, countered works and goes against what they've been building up as the Dark Order. Oh, you're a loser. You're tired of losing. Come join us. We're gonna we're gonna build you up. And then the Exultant comes in and basically just tells everyone they're piece of shit. I don't know. It just didn't. I don't know. I just the whole thing. We're talking ring psychology. It just isn't clicking for me, and I don't think it's clicking for a lot of the audience either. To be honest with you, but you that's know, my opinion. You know, it'd be great in this role, Carlito, because he tells everyone they're not. <laughs> Carlito, Carlito in a suit is money. We need to no, call think, Carlito. I think Matt Hardy would have been excellent in it, but I just don't think he really saw the benefit for his character of being the exalted one. That's why he probably passed on it. I bet you money he passed on it. Probably. In my opinion, I bet you money that they wanted him to be the exalted one, and he kind of went, nah, plus he was kind of riding a, uh, kind of riding a uh, face turn, and kind of a face thing as he's leaving the company to come in as the heel. But I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe, well, maybe I'm be, totally wrong. He probably doesn't want to be a bad guy in front of his kids right now. <laughs> You're right. If Shawn Michaels didn't want to be a, a bad guy in front of his kids when he made his uh, comeback in 2002, I if I were to really recall, he wasn't a heel at all from that 2002 to 2010 run. I mean, if we count the DX run of that, he wasn't really a heel. That was a baby face role for DX. True. So we place the kids into the equation. Maybe that's why he won't ever be a heel for a bit of time. Hmm. Makes sense. Did I get my idea for this match? No. No, did any of us? Yeah, I think so. Right? Did we? Are we all going, John? Yeah, I think so. All right, I'm going against popular opinion. I'm going with John. I'm going to go with Dean Ambrose. <laughs> oh God! There's I like it. Of- yes. <laughs> He's going with Cody back to WWE. Yes. It's like, oh, this isn't working out. I gotta yeah, go. <laughs> After this pay per view, everyone's just going back to where they were. Kenny's going to NJPW along with the Elite. And uh, Matt Hardy, he, he's going to go back to um, Vince and say, hey, I'm sorry. I needed a vacation. Oh my God. Yeah. We're lucky in March. We go to the, what's the next one on the card? Uh, <laughs> Let's go. Next match on the card is the 10 man ladder match. We're people guys 10 that's fucking 10 fingers guys i've uh, got darby allen cold cabana orange cassidy joey wow. janela wow scorpio sky kip saban frankie kazarian luchasaurus and a person to be named see that i went twice around my fingers mm. that's a pretty yeah. Pretty good. Mm-hmm. Pretty damn good lineup right there. Very yeah. much is. Ray Phoenix isn't going to be in it. He was, but he got, I think, an injury or something. Nothing for an extended period of time, but that that bump he took off that top rope flip thing. That's what, what it happened was. to uh, Pac. He's stuck in England. And what about uh, Pentagon? I think he lives in Mexico City, and he's stuck there too. Damn it! Okay, well, I think yeah, I think Junior is the only one, or Phoenix is the only one that lives in the states. Well, that sucks. Uh, well, uh. all right. Well, let's, let's do um, predictions for who the the tenth person is. Predictions for the match and over under on one ladder being broken, <laughs> half a ladder being broken. Hmm. So if we're doing an over on ladder, ladder being broken, it be, what? If we're doing a over under on ladders being broken, I think I'm going to go over. If we're doing one, I okay, think, let's yeah, do yeah. one one and a half. So <laughs> two ladders break. At least, I'm going to go with at least four ladders are going to be broken. Jesus Christ! How many backs do you want broken during this match? There's ten people. At yeah, least, there's a lot of people. At least nine of them should have back at the end of this. I'll, I'll go with five broken ladders. I'm going to go with one. Just one single ladder. It's going to be a big one. It's going to be like the length of my car. That's not that long, but 
the length of my car. Oh, Lord. All right, predictions All right. on the uh, last individual of the match. I'm going to go with my original prediction. I say Lance Archer comes in. He comes in and gets it. After losing to Cody. A lot of things had to happen. Uh, so I'm saying who just got released from WWE? I know who hasn't been in the company for a while. Shoot your shot, Nick. Who is it? No, I can't. Okay. CM Punk. Oh, no. Get, he's done with the backstage role with WWE. He's going to go. He's just, in contract <laughs> with them. He's in contract with Fox in that backstage. He can't just walk out on that. That's big money. Hey, big Fox. Um, um, if I'm being serious, I'm going to go. I, I don't know. It's really hard with all people sheltered. Tony Khan. Tony Khan's just going to show up and pull a Vince Russo. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> just kendo stick everybody. It's going to walk and be like, I want a title shot. This is my company. I want something. All 120 pounds of them. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, I, how, how, how heavy is Tony Khan? I bet you I they know, have this on here. I know who it is. Who is Shoot it. it. It's Zero. Formerly known as Cassius Ono. Is he a free agent? Mm-hmm. Uh, he put it on his Twitter and everything. He's like, Chris Hero is back. And he was mm. big in the Indies. I can see them bringing him into AEW for sure. For sure. Yeah, I, I agree, but I, I, I don't know. I'm going to go Chris Hero. That's my I pick. like it. I like it. All right. Well, <clears throat> sure, I'll go with that. I'll agree with you. I don't think he would win, though. His card's... Got Who, wins? Who wins? Who uh, wins? Going Darby. I'm being realistic. Say, Darby's going a pretty, Darby. pretty good pick for that. If this was 15 years ago, it would have been Kazarian, but this isn't 15 right. years ago. So think about it, though. So if, if Cody wins, it would be Darby and Cody again, and if Lance Archer wins, it would be Lance and Darby well, no, this is for the world title and not the TNT title. Yeah, the latter match is for a number one contendership for the AEW title. Oh. So hmm. they've been fighting Mox. Hmm. So list, list the name and names again. Darby Allen, Cole Cabana, Orange Cassidy, Joey Janela, Scorpio Sky, Kip Sabin, Frankie Kazarian, Luchasaurus, and who we believe is Chris Hero. That's a whole lot of fucking faces. It's 10 people. It's 10 fingers. I know, but that's a lot of faces. That's one hand, two times. <sighs> it's definitely not Cole Cabana. It probably wouldn't be Orange Cassidy. Joey Janelle is not title material. Frankie Kazarian's past his prime. Luchasaurus, not really. So maybe Kip. Wait, where's Sammy Guevara? Oh, he's in the he's in the state the Stampede match. Yeah. If he was in it, I would have given him a chance. That's what I'm saying. When I look at that lineup, I see a lot of like fan favorite faces. And to go up against Mox, I would think. Darby has the best chance, or whoever that unknown opponent is. Can you see any of those guys go, like doing a good promo, doing a good uh, work, or doing a good program with with Mox right now? Most of them already wrestling. Idol. Hold on. I'll be right back. Oh shit. I mean, unless it's Hager. That's the mystery guy. But they just went. They just went. Stampede a match, huh? I and they, will bet and they, you. And they just went. They just went, the Mox and him. It's got to be something, a good, it's got to be a next new good feud for Moxley or it's a waste of time. I will bet you 
an AMC movie ticket that Darby Allen wins. To just lose against Mox? Yep. Again? And they've already fought. So just to lose It'll against be Mox. Closer. Against It'll be like a Jeff Hardy versus Taker match from 2002 with how close he got. It'll solidify that he'll be a child contender in the future. See, this is what this is what makes me think that what you said, Bill, of Archer coming in and being the mystery guy after losing to Cody, that's what makes me kind of think that that could be a possibility. He'll come it's in, gotta, the mystery guy, and, gotta, then it, and then him and Mox. That would be good it. to see. They had a good what was that that Texas Death Match that they had in New Japan? That was a see, hell of a match that they had. I think. It, Exactly, and to re kind of recreate that for the AEW audience, who lot probably have you know some of them haven't seen New Japan, would be a really good booking decision. So yeah, yeah, I'm still another pick from Archer to Cody. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Did I that? You're stuck. <laughs> Locked in. Hmm. Have we been taking note of our predictions? Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Yeah. How do I look? Uh, you? <laughs> strong, strong. Very strong. Very, oh, good. very, good. very Thanks. powerful. I feel like that I mean, happened this time around. Oh, just absolutely just, I mean, I'm giving up. I'm, I, think, I think you've already got it. You We're know what no movie. one ever does? A dead last title. There should be a dead last title. You're going on a New England Patriots 18-0 and 0 run. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Only to lose it at the end. If only I knew how to get some videotapes in, I'd be a winner. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. All right, there's one last match on the card. I finally yes, said it correctly. Thank God. It is the stadium stampede match with Matt Hardy and the elite, which includes Adam Page, Kenny Omega, Matt Jackson, Nick Jackson, going up against the horribly named inner circle, which is Chris Jericho, Jack Hager, Sammy Guevara, Santana, and Ortiz, or LAX number two. We should tweet that to Jericho. The horribly named inner circle is a bad name. It is a very bad name. I could quoted the horribly, horribly well. named inner circle. Call me a stupid idiot. <laughs> a little bit of the bubbly. Chris Jericho's over. <laughs> he so, is so over. Um, but for this. I kind of think it's going to. Wait a minute. I know who the mystery guy is. It's King Maxwell. Oh? King so Maxwell. Anyway, Matt Hardy's son. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. I see it now. now. That kid's going to be over as hell. Can't be bad. Let's see. I kind of see it as Inner Circle wins this match, and then when they finally go into Blood and Guts, um, the Elite will win that match. Hmm. So I think I'm going to go with the Inner Circle on this one. This yeah. will be Matt Hardy's first major pay-per-view. We should all take that into the equation. <laughs> Do we want Matt Hardy to lose on his first pay-per-view? He won't be the reason why they lose, but I still think, like, he'll – they'll put him over for sure, but it'll be in a losing effort, I think. Would that be wonderful, though? Wonderful. Hmm. Because that's why I say I think – it's a stadium stampede match, no fans. Give them a loss. So when it goes to blood and guts, when they actually do have some fans, that's when you want to give Matt Hardy his due, his pop. Interesting. Ah, I, I, 
I could see that. I could see that. We'll see. I, I'm. Yeah, I think. I, oh God, hold on. It's a little far fetched, but. Big Nick. Big Nick. Who you got? We go with the inner circle. <laughs> I have nothing else to say but that. Shits on them. Shits on the name. Picks them. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly, right? Oh, Perfect what? logic. I like it. So that's what they call a troll on YouTube. Yeah. That's exactly what they call a troll. <laughs> So I don't know, you know, I think it felt like they were kind of getting the team back together with the young bucks showing up again after a long time away from quarantine and then and then uh uh hangman Adam Page doing his ninety yard sprint across the field. Like they were just all coming together and yeah, and then they kind of chase off the inner circle and Adam Page does his loner alcoholic walk off again. Yeah, I think inner circle wins. I think you're right. I think uh they gotta, they gotta get a payoff in front of a crowd with that. Super duper, name. Super duper, gentlemen. That is the entire card. Nine matches on one card. Over under on three hours. Under. Under. Just under. Over to be three and a half. <laughs> If only we were so lucky. <clears throat> I changed your name, Nick. This is what we're going with now. Big Troll and Nick. I love it. <laughs> I got a better one. Bold predictions, Nick. The Swole Troll. Swole Troll. Swole Troll. I the love swole it. Troll. That's a good yeah. one, actually. It's a t-shirt right now. <laughs> the Swole yeah. Troll. It's a shirt right there. Damn, that's a good one. But you're gonna have to get bigger. You're gonna have to get more swole. You gotta start doing more reps. It's not good and enough, heavy. sir. No, heavier web, more reps with heavier weight. You gotta bring oh. it into the bring it into about that category, or that category. How was that? <laughs> there you go, swole troll, Nick. I like that one. That's good. <laughs> let's get let's get the backlash before we're lashed back into the past. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Nick. Yeah. Go ahead. What do we got on the backlash? Yeah, we got a segue, guys. <laughs> what do we got on the backlash card, Nick? We got Big Swole. Call me. All right. All right. Okay. So far on this backlash card, there are four matches. We have Asuka going up against possibly Charlotte Flair, Natalia, or Nia Jax. Braun Strowman in that handicap match against the Miz and Morrison team. Drew McIntyre going up against, uh, for some reason, given push, Bobby Lashley. And an oddly singled match between Edge and Randy Orton. I don't want to do predictions for this just yet, but I do want to... There's only one thing to talk on here, and it's about Edge and Orton. Why do they go from a last man standing match to a singles match? That you're going counterclockwise. That's not how it works. It's supposed to be singles, then maybe steel cage, and then last man standing. Now we're going backwards. There's no need for a singles match. You're thinking of it in the most traditional of traditional ways that there's no traditional terms? They're, they're go backwards all you want, whatever it is. The fact that they're actually doing long term story booking with Edge and Randy Orton right now is good. It's beautiful, oh, yeah. That's like one of the only long term long term storytelling that they've been doing this entire time. So I want them to keep it. Keep having Randy Orton and Edge having, you know, badass 30, 45 minute matches. I'm okay. Exactly. Another 40 minutes? Yeah. Uh, over under on 30 minutes. If go. Edge can go and it looks good and it's well done, fuck it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Give yeah. me more. I agree. I think it's, I think it's, uh, and if you're watching the story build up, it makes sense. The story build up makes sense. And it, I mean, whether it's going to be the greatest wrestling match of all time, whatever they're building it as, it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be good entertainment, good theater. And I think it's going to be a, a 
just another step in their uh, evolution in this whole storyline right now. My and you're thinking, good. you're thinking linear. This is a not a linear storyline. These guys have been going. Uh, the storyline just goes way back. Yeah, I think to be honest. I hope they don't, because I had things going in my head, so I hope they don't make it like a cinematic style match or whatever. Just have a regular, you know, you know, wrestling match, whatever it is. And if it does, you know, turn out to be one of the greatest matches of all time, hey, so be it. You had a, one of the greatest matches of all time performed by one guy who just got back you know, this is literally his, what, third match since coming back. He had the Royal Rumble, he had WrestleMania, and now this. His third match coming back from, you know, that neck surgery and everything, something that we thought he was never going to come back from. I never thought I was going to see Edge in the ring ever again. Right. Is You know, so for, and he's, what, 40, 45? I'll look that up right now. He's like 45, 46, somewhere, somewhere around there, I think. He's in his 40s. Randy Orton is still – Randy Orton is still one of the best professional wrestlers when he's motivated. When he's motivated to actually put on a match, Randy Orton can perform. True. So him and Edge that – and Edge, storytelling-wise – Edge is one of the best to ever do it. Top five is, for me. Edge is 46 years old. 46 years old. So you know, that's what I'm saying. Like for Edge, he's one of the best storytellers. And during his time off, he had been doing, you know, movies and scripts and all that. He did uh, Vikings. He was in Vikings. He was on Flash. Sure. So he's getting the ideas like you know, of storytelling. He's getting more ideas on how to do things, how to execute things. You know, doing his own stunts helps him, you know, choreograph being able to what what to do. So I think this possibly does have the potential to turn out to be one of the greatest matches of all time. You know, so that's at this point the only match that I'm really excited about. The Braun Strowman handicap match, I think, was complete fucking waste of time. Complete waste of time. Should have continued yes. the story. If you were going to do anything with Braun, continue the story with Bray. Have Bray continue to just keep messing with his head because when he did fight Bray for the Universal title, it wasn't The Fiend. Exactly. Braun Strowman hasn't fought The Fiend. You know, so I think during this handicap match, Bray is going to continue to play mind games at some point. It'll be the puppets. Or, yeah, the puppets are going to pop up out of nowhere or some, something with the black sheep face ma- or uh, mask. It's going to be something, something's going to go on with it. But I, it's just, it's a replayed thing that they've constantly done with Braun putting him in handicap matches to show how big and strong he is and all that other kind of thing. It's just, it's played out. You're diminishing the title again. Nobody takes the universal title seriously right now. You know, since fucking Goldberg took it, you know, now with Braun, it, it's, you hope with his first run, it would be something well done, well put together. Keep him out of the goddamn handicap matches. Give him a challenge. Give him yeah. something that's actually going to push him to be a good champion. Do something like what McIntyre's doing. He's putting up, you know, good matches against big names, against Seth Rollins, get, you know, things like that. I think they just need to continue to keep giving them a challenge. Like these little wish wash matches for championships are just, it's a pain in the ass and it's a waste of time. And I think it's, pretty much insulting everybody's intelligence the only the only way this gets pulled off as a good match is if you're right if they somehow continue the story of the fiend storyline if the fiend comes in at the end after he's won and the fiend attacks him and it goes into a you know a storyline that we can buy into i can't buy into this i don't see miz and morrison being the champions i don't see him losing to these guys it's like you said it's a waste of time 
There's no credibility behind it. If you're going to have this match, at least put it, like, for non-title. Don't say it's for the title because nobody's going to take it seriously because everyone knows that Braun's not going to lose. They say that um, they do have the puppets, like, around the ring, so they continue the Fiend storyline, and that distracts Braun, then giving either Morrison or Miz an opportunity to cash in and win the title and now we'll have an interesting storyline where the universe title is held by two men who are legitimate enough to hold the universal title and then we can continue the Braun and fiend storyline without a belt giving more focus on the story rather than the belt and the belt can go elsewhere with two men holding it because we haven't had that since punk and cena held the titles together that weird awkward thing back in the summer of 2011 and they can fight other people maybe give Kofi his rematch after almost a year ta-da booking win uh, I don't see that for sure uh, like at all really it's a far stretch it's not going to happen but it's a far far stretch you talk about diminishing the title that's going to do it right there I don't think it's diminishing I think it'd be intriguing that's some Attitude Era stuff. But if you're going to compare it to, you know. Like China and Eddie or, no, China and Chris Jericho holding the Intercontinental title simultaneously back in 2000. I don't think that's the same. It's two different singles people having the same title at the same time is different than a tag team holding a single singles title. This would be the equivalent if, Kofi won the WWE title, but it was, you know, Xavier Woods or Big E defending it, you know, type of thing. That'd be interesting. That would have been more interesting. Like, say, Kofi didn't want to go out and, you know, fight a certain person. Like, they basically do it by matchups. So, I don't know. Unless they use it to uh, break up the Miz and Morrison, which I don't want them to do. I don't see it being much of a, a much of a, a, a much of a, a, a step up for the title or an advancement of the title. And then it's just my opinion. Is there anything else we want to talk about on this card? Just one thing. Just one thing. One thing. I, yeah. Well, I don't think I don't think Bobby Lashley is going to go over on on Drew because they really have long term plans for him, and rightfully so. The guy is. He has not stuttered. He, I love everything they're doing with him right now. But if, if as long as Bobby Lashley can come out looking good in a loss, he could be on his last run. He could be on his last push and last run with his company because he just is, I mean, in my opinion, I just didn't maybe an unpopular opinion. I just think he is one of those guys that has the look that Vince loves, but Vince can never see a picture which – of which Bobby Lashley gets over with the fans and is a good heel uh, champion or champion at all. I just don't. So he's going to have, we'll see how it goes, but I definitely think it's, it's Bobby Lashley's swan song. He's got to, he's got to really do something. And I think he will, he, he can look good in losing. They just got to, they got to book it right. I think with Bobby Lashley, it's a shame because he, he did have a lot of, you know, wind at his back when he came into the WWE. People were excited to see him. He was doing good things in Impact, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, so for him to come in, people had high hopes that Bobby Lashley was going to – it was one of those things that they signed somebody because he had a lot of backing behind Mm -hmm. him. They're trying to capitalize on the merch opportunities and things like that, and they just – shit the bed when it came to actually developing his character you know so it's just or did, or did he shit the bed in developing his character because if you look at it for example in my opinion you have two guys both who left the company and came back to the company recently and they're both on two different trajectories where drew kind of has just got he did he did enough work where he's able to kind of call his own shot on his character development and his character development is awesome whereas lashley's is lacking He's but if you look at it. if you look at the scenarios and situations that Drew and Lashley were put into, the storylines and everything that they were given, to be honest, 
if we're flipping the script, if you're giving Lashley what Drew was given and Drew what Lashley was given, I'm not so sure Drew could – putting Drew in a storyline with Lana against Rusev, do you think that would have been good for Drew? No. it would. You know what? But I think what we're looking at is just a true superstar, which I think, I think McIntyre can be and will be and is, can take a crap gimmick or a crap uh, storyline and just by – over delivering and doing it to a point where it gets noticed can then, you know, I mean, you look at some of the crap they put on Steve Austin, you know, there's only the, the, ring, the ringmaster and all this crap. And he just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. I think there's a, there's another gear, another level. And I see it in Macintosh where he's, he was putting some stupid things with Baron Corbin and all those guys. And he was just kind of like a henchman kind of whatever, I don't know, whatever. And then, he he just kept going and pushing and performing every night to where he got that opportunity to really so and I think I don't know I'm I'm not trying to bury Lashley I'm just saying he's he's got a really even in this loss I think he could he could really look good doing it and really advance his character and advance his storyline and give McIntyre the right the right push he, you know the more push and as a champion as a strong champion as a strong face champion I just think, I think Lashley would be all right but, I just think with Lashley. When you're given a storyline that from Jump Street, the fans are already over it, like they're not going to give it a chance, doesn't matter really how good you are. It's kind of like, mm, if the fans are kind of like, yeah, no, we're not into this, and we're not giving it a shot. Once the fans are done with it, they're done with it. Move but on. isn't it – isn't it on the isn't it on the onus of the performer to to make? I mean, can't they make it? Haven't we seen guys like Kurt Angle take some pretty crappy storylines and and just shine and 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 really even sometimes when he was a secondary character steal the show on some of those promos and some of the some of the matches? I don't know. I think we'll it's just see. Meant, I mean, if it's meant to be a comedy act or something like that, and then they're performing it like what Kurt Angle was doing. If it's meant to be a comedy act and they're performing, good. But it's not. What Lashley was put in with Lana and Rusev, that wasn't meant to be a comedy act. That no. was meant to be something that you know, Bobby Lashley's interfering with somebody else's relationship and all that kind. Of, it just with the crowd, it was all, you know. Right. But I'm asking you guys. Certain things that you're given, you have to be able to do. I agree. But there are certain things to where the hole is dug so deep, it doesn't matter how much you scratch and claw, you're not getting out of it. It's you I just got, I, I, the next story. I think a superstar with some more, with, some, with something more to them, a little, the little zip of zest in their step, I think could have taken that and made it there, could have made it a little bit better. Whereas Lashley just seemed like the third wheel in that whole storyline. But I think I just, I, again, I'm, I, you know, on popular opinion, I don't know that Lashley is that, that prototypical WWE superstar has it all the, all the aspects that they're looking for. I'm not saying he's not a great wrestler. I'm not saying he's not a great guy. And he did some really good stuff in Impact. I did catch some of it. I just think that sometimes some of these guys don't do well under Vince's strict, rigid, that's true. That could be it. So, that could be it. Know, but the yeah. schedule can be a yeah, just factor everything factor to certain people. The cops in the background. Yeah, we got a lot of problems here in this area. It's it's a, it's a, it's the ghetto. No, no, I don't know what it is. It's uh, probably probably some Rockland mom uh, is upset because she has to wear a mask in Costco. <laughs> I feel the pain. I was about to say, like, live in like Rockland, Roseville. I'm like, that is not. <laughs> no, it's, it's not the hood, bro. It's not the hood. It's Karen territory, bro. I'm living, I'm living in the Karen land. Yikes. Yeah. Well, that's backlash. Yeah, that's backlash. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the part of the show where, again, we've talked about this before, and I really do think that it's going to turn into its own thing it's time to get into this week's segment of 
the rematch. Nick? The rematch. Rematch, ladies and gentlemen. All right. I have said it before and I'll say again. This is a riff of Bill Simmons Podcast Rewatchables where we take back a match from the past, review it, look at some of the high ends of it and the low ends of it. And before I get into the, the all those categories that we have done, let me give you a little t- uh, background on it. The 505 <laughs> matches we need to watch before we die. All right. Rob Van Dam versus Jerry Lynn in Hardcore Heaven 1999. May 16th at the New York City Civic Center. If one were to introduce ECW to a curious newcomer, this would serve as the perfect entry point, for it distilled the electric essence of the company into one spellbinding match. It wrapped up a few funny months. Directly from... Nick. What? We can't directly read from somebody else's book. We We're giving them credit. That's why I'm showing it. It's giving you them credit. Gotta say that before it, who it is. Like you gotta... that's why I'm showing this credit. <laughs> oh my god! We are so getting demonetized with it. What culture is going to send a cease and desist for? Sure they would. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! <sighs> <laughs> Well, I love you, buddy. I love you, dude. <laughs> so, you were what? gonna read off that for your intro for the? Well, I wasn't able to do it. I was busy yesterday, so I had to do uh, something to. And I found that in my room, so <laughs> went off of that. So, <laughs> yeah. This is the rematch, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right. Well, let's just get to it. What's the most rewatchable? Let's just get into details. Where are you guys' first initial thoughts of the match? Bill, you want to go first? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it was a it was a good match. I enjoyed that. I don't think I caught it the first time, so it was a nice re- it was a nice watch for me. So it really wasn't a rewatch, but it was a really good match and. Uh, uh, you know, I thought there was, it was pretty stiff. It seemed like there was a lot of, a lot of stiff shots and it was kind of an ECW style of just, seems like it was a little, um, uh, hectic, a little hazardly, but I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I, I, I could watch it again. I thought there was some good spots on it. And, uh, and Jerry Lynn has always, always been underrated for me. I don't know why he doesn't get more credit for, for a lot of the stuff that, uh, that, uh, he, he really, he really brought to the table and really you can see it with, with this, this match with RVD and RVD, of course, the whole gimmick he has now in impact is that all these young kids are stealing his moves and they're just basically rehashing uh, old RVD and watching this match kind of really kind of brought that point to a, to a, to a head for me. Yeah. A lot of stuff we see now that we love at the AEW and some of the stuff even in, in WWE with NXT it does remind me a lot of like this match and a lot of the spots they had, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff they put together. It was, it was, a, it was, it was fun. It was fun to rewatch, except for the guy with the whistle. I, it really made it hard for me to listen. Oh, Alfonso can't go. Oh. That's Paul Heyman <sighs> on some Coke right there. Yeah. They had to take that whistle from him. That was, that was made it almost unwatchable because it just kept going. <clears throat> anyway. Yeah. That was one of the things I was, that was one of the things I was gonna put that didn't age well. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to the we'll get to the categories in a moment, but Josh, what are your first initial thoughts when you look at um this? first initial thoughts? I've seen this match before um a couple of times uh in the past and every time that I've seen it, I've always thought it was one of those like it was one of R V D's, you know, best matches for sure. And Jerry Lynn, like like you said, Bill, I, like I could have said it better. He definitely didn't get as much credit as he probably deserved on his abilities. Um, in the match, I saw a lot of, like, today's AEW. 
like with kind of with the stiffness a little bit with the athleticism how everything kind of the kind of the way the crowd uh reacts with everything um but yeah overall this whole match from beginning to end other again other than the fucking whistle uh, <laughs> That was a pain in the ass to hear over headphones the whole time. You can hardly hear the commentary and stuff because of it at some points. Um, and Joey Styles was you know, obviously a great commentator for ECW at that time. Is perfect fit for that mm -hmm. role. Um, but yeah, overall, I I think it was a really well done match. And had this match been done in WWE at that time we'd probably be looking at this as in there when you go to N or uh wwe network you see when they have greatest matches of all time they'll have yeah, that yeah. In there. they would have that match in there for sure i think yeah this match never had a, a dull moment it, it went from um, one spot to the next spot. It wasn't a spot fest. There was a little bit of narrative to this match as their previous match a few months ago. Uh, they went to a time stop, but then the, it continued with both men agreeing that we need to finish this match up. I believe that was an accident. You can see the confusion in both men's eyes. Like, oh, oh, we went over time. Whoops. And that initially, that's the only true storyline to this match is that now since there's no time to this match we're just going to go until there's a true winner they pull all the punches out until one can truly not get up anymore and i thought that was just beautiful for what this was in ecw with not that much storyline but violence non-stop all the way yeah and um i believe we're gonna have many rewatchable scenes so let's just jump straight into it Bill, what's your most rewatchable scene? All right, it's it's two. I have uh, my first rewatchable scene. I can watch that 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 left elbow that Jerry Lynn throws and busts open uh, uh, RVD. I could watch that. It was a good stiff shot and caught him in that eyeball, caught him on above his eye and, and got him. And the second one is when uh, when Jerry Lynn goes over, uh, he gets tossed over the ropes at one point and hits the ground. And that's where he gets blood, and I'm not sure if it's bladed or if he actually really hit the cement because, you know, it was it looked pretty rough. There was that point where there was that point in the match where you almost think that he's really knocked out. Like, there's some stalling and some time there where, you know, it, it, I maybe I marked up a little bit on it, but uh, that was a that was another remarkable move for me where he was just I thought he was really I thought he might have really gotten his bell wrong and maybe even cracked his head open on the cement. But like I said, I probably marked up on it. It probably was just him blading and. They were just covering while they, while they, while they got the blood flowing. But it was there were those those were the two those were two remarkable moments for me. I, I love that that back elbow he throws, and the whole crowd reacted because you could tell it was a good stiff shot to the eye. Definitely, Josh. You have a couple or yeah. one that, that you think stands out. That one right there where he took that elbow. That was that was one of them for me as well. But a, a couple of other ones was. Anytime that I can see RVD, you know, do some sort of springboard, anything, you know, from the springboard, you know, leg drop uh, to Jerry Lynn on the outside when he was draped over the um, barricade, uh, the spinning back, you know, kick to Jeremy Lynn's face with the chair right there, you know, just anything like that for me watching RVD, you know, do his thing like that. It's just, it's always fun to watch, you know, but, uh, but yeah, taking the elbow and then afterwards kind of, you know, you see him looking at the camera pointing to it. Oh, he got me. He got me. Oh, it was just kind of like, okay. And the crowd being into it, you know, as well from beginning to end, you know, a typical crazy ass ECW crowd, w. <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, for for me, the most rewatchable moments for sure would be uh, just RVD doing his thing and then taking the elbow. <laughs> There's a couple for me. The one that wasn't so uh, isn't my rewatchable, but is second to it is when Lynn no sell the five star frog splash and went for a roll up pin. 
I was just like, whoa, man, what did you do that for? Um, or like, oh, I'm just going to steal this and not take God at all. Okay. So that was pretty rude, but it was so cool. It's like, oh, holy crap, someone just knows self this. Uh, and then aside from that, it would the my most rewatchable moment was the sunset flip from the top ropes for Jerry Lynn, and then just power bombed the hell out of RVD to the table. It looked like his feet caught on to the tail first, so I thought it was gonna crack it there, but then it just completely demolished. Like, whoa! I completely forgot the table was there because so much action was going on. And for when he did, I was like, oh shit! Yeah, oh, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> That was a good bump. That was a great bump. Right there. That was the best moment of the match. Like, this is one of my favorite matches now. <laughs> We're all just hurting each other. But, <laughs> um, all right. What do you guys believe aged the best from this match? Let's start with, with uh, RVD's onesie. <laughs> that, that aged well. That wasn't his best. Um, onesie, but it was pretty good looking. Anytime he can wear, anytime RVD's singlet, you know, definitely aged well with his character, the different types of designs and tie dye stuff and all. Typical fucking, you know, stoner hippie that <laughs> RVD was, <laughs> you know. So, right. Yeah, I, I would think RVD's singlet definitely aged well. Um, the move sets between RVD and Jerry Lynn. You, you see that now, yeah. To this day, like with damn near everyone, you know. So basically, both of their move sets and RVD singlet are the things that age the best when it came to this. Totally agree. Uh, I think that their the move sets they had. Uh, in that match. And now I know there are other promotions doing it and probably other wrestlers, but it really does buy into what, like I said earlier, what, what RVD's gimmick is right now, but all these young kids are stealing his move sets and his, what he did, you know, back in that time in that era. But it's so true with just the, the, like you said, I think you said it, Nick, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't spot heavy, but just so many good, like, transition another thing that i thought really went well was also a lot of the um the near misses and no cells and the uh, mm -hmm. uh where they where they can't really countered each other they knew exactly what each other was going to do it was like you see that a lot now even more like overplayed at times but then back then that was really you know miss just barely missing each other like a leg drop and then rolling into this and rolling to that and just missing 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 and then standing off you know squaring up together at the very yeah. end I kind of that was that was not happening that much back then, and they really they that you know pat them pat themselves on the back. That was absolutely they age were, well. They were way ahead of their time. I think. Yes. Oh, definitely. They knew I mean, very well that they weren't going to get over in the industry off the status quo, which was be tall and muscular. Neither men were that. They were short and. They were good build, but they weren't, you know, mass muscle built. Right. So they got over with their technical and athletic ability, which is now why the company is revolutionized where it's at now with all these great indie wrestlers and every company we know now. Yep. So true. Um, what also has aged well, as I'd like to know from you guys' perspective, mm -hmm. is RVD's heel work. Yes. That was some quiet heel work that him just talking at the crowd, not truly paying attention to Jerry Lynn at times. And that's the only time the match like took a small break was for him to work on his character. And it's like, I'm the best thing. I don't need to sh show it to you. You already know it. That's why you guys are here. His heel work <clears throat> to me at that time, because you could actually look at it this way is more of an anti-hero. Exactly. Yeah at, yeah. at that point, because the fans loved him. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't a heel in the traditional sense where the fans hated him. Well, yeah, definitely. But he, he's like a Kevin Owens from back in 2015 when he was going up against John Cena, where he was a heel, but the crowd loved him. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
That's what I'm saying. But with with RVD again, would you say something that aged well? That style of when you look at this entire match, that style of wrestling is what is huge now. Exactly. That's what AEW is capitalizing on. WWE is kind of dabbling back into it. But again, when we say ahead of their time, way ahead of their time, I think. Way ahead of their time. Those matches, five stars today. With crowd reaction and everything. We'll get to Dave Meltzer's rating because that's a (laughs) – that's the first time I think I'll give it more or less. I'm not, I don't want give to it, give it away, but it's, um, it's truly a more or less with this one coming up. But also, I believe it's age well, maybe not for you guys, is the name of the review on the ring mat. They don't do that at all anymore. So I thought, well, that's kind of cool. I missed that. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was looking at that too, going, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Really, the only one who didn't do that back then was WWE. WCW did it. ECW was doing it. Other wrestling promotions were doing it. WWE was really kind of the only one who didn't put the logo or some sort of logo, something right in the center of the ring. But I agree. That was something that was I thought was pretty cool. It always added a little extra to the pay-per-view. Like, they did – don't do it during the um, the TV shows. But you do it, do it during the pay-per-view kind of gives a little special flair to it, I guess. But I, I liked it. I thought it was pretty cool. Bill, do you have anything else you want to share? Or should we jump to what's aged the worst? Let's move. Let's go. All right. What's aged the worst? I mean, I'll start off pretty handily. There's a guy in a corn shirt in kind of the first row. And that does just not fit well. I'm sorry. Corn fans. We with a K, it's weird. I'm sorry. Just, you can't do that to me. Um, there, were a few, there were a few botches in this match. One in particular, they were both on top of the turnbuckle, and it looked like RVD was about to fall backwards, but then he just fell straight down onto the middle of the ropes and hit his balls, and Jerry Lynn basically just fell on his back onto the ring. But, yeah, those are to start off this topic of what's aged worse some ticky tack botches and the corn guy. I would go with the whistle. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the whistle just I could deal with him as a manager running around and being annoying and stuff like that. I get that. I, I get that's what the shtick was. You know, just wanted to be in that annoying piece of trash that everyone hated. But it was more of like he was getting bad heat because everyone loved RVD. But they were trying to get like, dude, get away. You're fucking up his character. You're fucking up his whole thing with that damn whistle. Yeah. Like, I can't stress enough how annoying that thing was to listen to every 10 to 15 seconds. Or if, if basically, if either one of them did anything, he would start blowing the whistle, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. He'd start blowing the whistle, getting at the top, blowing the whistle. You know, just he's the best hype man for. I, I get the hype man, but you can be a hype man without that goddamn whistle. Yeah, it was bad, but uh, if it's if at some point I want to turn off the sound because it was so annoying every time they would go to start a move set and start to move and start to do something. It just was there. And I got these like freaking earbuds in. It was like, and the audio, the audio, I would have loved, please, you pump up the, the commentators a little bit more and drowned out that freaking whistle, man. It was so annoying. And it, it really, it really took away from the match. You're talking about something that really took away from the match, not just aged wrong or aged poorly. It took away from the match. It was a great, great match. Makes it most unbearable to rewatch with that stupid whistle. And then you can't hear Styles very well. And it's just, he's got such a great voice. Like, un- unfortunately, it's just one of those things that they, you know. Yeah, they, there, was an, you know. there was an issue with the sound because you could hear the crowd perfectly, but they kind of went, they took over Joey Styles and 
I couldn't hear a single thing he said. I he could have said "Oh my God" five times. I wouldn't have catched a single "Oh my yeah. God." I don't um, remember any. It was the crowd and their different chants. Uh, they had some good chants. I can't recall any of them right now, but it, it was just nothing for Joey Styles. It was just the whistle, the crowd, and the mat. That was it. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, if there's nothing else you guys would like to share for uh, what's aged the worst, um, let's go into what if recasting. Um, I who do you guys think would have fit well within this storyline aside from the two? Storyline or match? Both. Uh, let's stick to the move sets being the same, but just change the wrestlers. I don't think you really can like, keep the move. The whole thing, what made RVD and Jerry Lynn's matches, not just this match, but all of their matches that they had together, what made that, they just meshed. They had that chemistry. And you, you see interviews to this day, RVD, tch, he's like, can you put on, he's like, he's not, no, I can't, I can't do what I did with, Jerry Lynn with you because we don't have that trust. We don't have that chemistry. We don't have that. So it's real. This is one of those topics I was struggling with just trying to figure out who could have possibly had the same chemistry, the same type of, um, you know, similar move sets maybe, but chemistry for the most, who would have had that to where they could have put on this type of match and gotten the same type of reactions? And I just, I really just don't know. I really don't. It's, it's from that time period. I mean, right now there are wrestlers who could do that, those move sets, but that's for a later category. But at that time period, there's probably not that many that can do the move sets and the maybe. The choreography maybe eddie chris or or uh eddie dean like eddie guerrero was somebody maybe eddie guerrero is like the only one that pops into my head who was in ecw at that point who could have maybe done something like that maybe even eddie and ray at that time it's a different style, though. With right. the RVD and Jerry, there was some some physicalness. I mean, I'm not trying to take away Eddie's physicality, but the, there's a different Agreed. type of um, yeah. yeah, just aura to those two wrestlers that's different from Eddie. And it, it was a hip, extreme style, which I guess is. Oh, let me let me let me throw something out there. I think I think uh, early impact Samoa Joe and AJ Styles in that in that time period, in in that in with what they were able to do, they couldn't do in the WWE. Right. I don't know why they couldn't. Maybe because they're older, but that younger Styles, the shorter haircut when Joe was when Joe was just a great heel. You're talking about chemistry and trusting each other. Those guys, man, they you know they they you could tell they had a trust a, a trust and a, and a bond. And then, you know, skill set, I mean, age is going to make anyone, but, you know, but him and Samoa Samoa. Joe both, I don't know. Oh, yeah, you know maybe even for a big guy, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good recasting is, are those two wrestlers. I could see them going through, if we go to the similar storyline, we're both, yeah. both went over the time limit and say Samoa and Joe got the quick submission in, the, in a minute or two, and then. AJ wanted a rematch months later, and then they had the same slim move set to this match. I, a little different, obviously, because they have different move sets themselves. Um, it could be a, a well played match. Just I would put, I would put Samoa Joe in Jeremy Lin, or Jerry Lynn spot, and yes. RBD in AJ Styles or AJ Styles in RBD spot. I don't want it well, the other way around because I think you could, yeah. I mean, you could do it. You could do it either way, but kind of knowing like the moniker of each one of them, AJ comes off more of that arrogant prick type of thing, which well, is kind of what RVD was going for at that time. I'm talking about. Er, I mean, if if we're trying to get to that same time period, the closest we can get with AJ and Samoa Joe in the same uh, time period is around 2004 and TNA. 
And at that time, AJ was a, cl a clear John Cena type uh, yeah. baby face and Samoa Joe was a closer heel. So that's where yeah. I'd switch it. Now it's different where AJ is a true heel and Joe, Joe's off television. So he's not really well, doing anything. Well, just like with, uh, with Samoa Joe, and that, you know, that's when that uh, you know, Joe's going to kill you chant would come up. And, they, and here he's supposed to be the heel, but he's getting all this, uh, getting all this pop from the fans with chants and, you know, with like RVDs, you know, you know, the whole fucking show, whatever, you know, I mean, they were chanting for RVD through the whole thing. And he was this bad guy. And I, and I see where Joe would be the kind of anti, you know, the anti uh, mm -hmm. hero heel kind of character. Definitely. All right. Let's get to some half-ass internet research. There is one cool thing I found out about this, this um, of, not about the match, but just about the wrestlers in general, and that's Jerry Lynn. Jerry Lynn is the only wrestler to win a title in WCW, ECW, WWE, TNA, and Ring of Honor. He's the only guy to have done it in all those. Wow. Times. I didn't know that. I didn't either. What, what, what were all the It's hard to think about it. What were all the promotions again? WCW, ECW, WWE, TNA, and Ring of Honor. Did he ever wrestle? Did he ever wrestle in anything in New Japan? I imagine he had some. I wonder I mean, if he that, had it, but that, yeah. was, that was a stat I found offline. Someone else had found it already. That's yeah. cool. not that's a lot really of people good. say that. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. That's, very that's the good. only guy that can say that. Who? The He's only the guy. guy that, what? He's the only guy that can say that, which is really wow. cool. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Very That's the only thing I can really share. There's nothing else that showed up <laughs> in my internet research. I, I got I got a whole lot more respect for Jeremy Lin. Like I had respect for Jeremy Lin, but now or Jeremy Lin. What the fuck? Jeremy, Jeremy Lin. <laughs> that is his real name, actually. His it's real first name is Jeremy. <laughs> like I had respect for him before, but now hearing that, like holy shit. Like that's yeah. That's Put him in the Hall of Fame. Put yeah, him in the Hall of Fame. Oh, I don't think he'll be in the in the WWE Hall of Fame. He was only in the company for less than a year. If there yeah. was a, if there was a just pro wrestling Hall of Fame where like all your entire body of work, whatever promotion or whatever you went to, he would be in there. He has a better chance at getting in the TNA Hall of Fame than he does the WWE Hall of Fame. Whatever Hall right. of Fame it is, put him in. Yeah. <laughs> Put them all, all the whole things. All right, Apex Mountain. This isn't the Apex Mountain for the Apex Mountain um, time period for either wrestler, but I would say for R RVD is a tricky one to know where his Apex Mountain is. Um, he's had you know popular moments come, but they didn't go for a long stretch. Jerry Lynn has never reached the the high moments of, you know, the Cena's and the Hogan's, but he's had great lengths of uh, periods and co companies such as Ring of Honor and TNA. So I'd say for Jerry Lynn, it was uh, 2002, 2003, where he was in TNA, because he was rev uh, helped revolutionize the X Division. Yeah. Whereas RVD, I don't want to go straight away and say 2006 when he won the the WWE and ECW title because it only lasted not even a month. I'm sh I'm sure, um, but he he was one of the first guys that I knew that had a a legends contract, so he, that he didn't he didn't wrestle that often in TNA. So I would say that was his apex when he got that contract and was one of the first well known for having that type of schedule. Unless you guys have other ideas, throw it out there. No, I can't argue. Yeah, I was going to say, like, a, saying that this match would be their apex point is would be underlying both of their careers majorly. RVD and Jerry Lynn both went on after that to do great things. Granted, in different – they obviously went in different paths – in their career, RVD going to WWE and, um, you know, Jerry Lynn going, you know, basically everywhere else, WWE for a brief period of time, but 
um, going everywhere else after that, making a name for himself there. You know, it's it really is hard to dispute that that point that you were talking about um, wasn't their apex point. But I don't think I think at this point this was where they kind of put themselves on the map. Well, definitely, for sure. They, this was where they shot themselves to Strasker, but it, they didn't, they weren't at the mountain yet. Right. They were climbing it, for sure, but they did not reach their, their peak moment. Right, yeah, right. Now, it, it took longer lengths or different uh, stretches for both men to get there, but... They can both say at the end of the day they've had proud careers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Both up more opposite than you would have thought of. I would have thought RV, I mean, if you, you know, we all love RVD and we probably would have wished he had longer lengths with world titles. And, but that didn't happen because of his own decisions in life, which if were not. If he good. wasn't frowned upon back then, he'd still be wrestling. Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Like that's, right. that's what I think. If he, if he was, if he was like wrestling in his prime, and everything right now, they wouldn't even have a damn problem with it. Exactly. It was just at that time, it wasn't, you know, it was kind of frowned upon, you know, type of thing. Nobody really understood the benefits or whatever it was that came with it. So it was, you know, yeah. Obviously, now I think he's got his own strain, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, dumb if he didn't. So it's so like right now he's still he's still an icon, and he, like I said, RVD was one of those guys that was way ahead of his time. Jerry Lynn, I think if they would if WWE would have put him in more programs and stuff like that with RVD, that uh, they probably would have had a lot of better a lot more better programming at that time. If w, um, if Jerry Lynn stayed in WWE, he would have been a strong mid card. I want to see Matt Riddle and RVD in a tag team. Oh, God. <laughs> That's weird. That's That's a smell, real smell on one side of that ring. You're right. The skunk bros. Skunk bros. You come out with all the, like, the smoke coming from the back. It's not, it's oh, not artificial smoke, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you, could have them, you could have them go against the uh, those guys in Impact, the, uh, the, uh, the rascals. Have you oh. seen those guys at all? Yeah, I've oh, seen the rat. They're a pretty good team. They're pretty oh, good. They're, listen, they're a really good team. I I could see them in A and W or be NXT. Be yes, yes, I agree a hundred percent. That's another story for another day. Yeah. Uh, could this match work today? It obviously can. Many wrestlers are doing are having the same Absolutely. similar yeah. match style. So we we've already talked about. We can skip this. Absolutely. Um, uh, Dave, there's no unanswerable questions. There's no questions to take here today. Um, Dave Meltzer, over, under, or just right? He gave it a 4.25. I give it four and three quarters. I would have given it like a four, five, four, six, somewhere around that. A little bit higher, closer to a five. Because you, you got to think of everything. At that, I'm sure when Dave Meltzer was giving the rating at that time he wasn't thinking of the long term like what people looking back on this match were going to think oh yeah you know at that time was anybody taking ecw seriously at that time no exactly nine probably that was a paper so now that now that we're so far ahead of time when we can look back on it i'm sure if Meltzer would have actually looked at the long term impact that those two had with that match on the industry, he would have probably given it a little bit higher. It, it wasn't a five-star match, you know, because of there were certain aspects of it that could have changed. Fucking whistle. That could have been one of them. <laughs> you know, you could have that, could have, that could have bumped you up a star and a half in my book. You know, but overall, I think if he could have gone back and looked at it now, and look at the long-term general impact of those two guys and that match, he would have given it, you know, upwards 4.5 or higher, I think. He's a little under, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. My belief is he gave it a 4.25 because 
of the couple botches and the whistle and maybe the sound system was a little bad but everything else was top notch yeah. bill no i agree i agree with both you guys and there's no other thing i can add because it's, you're absolutely right this can be a little, a little bit more a little bit more than what he gave it agreed all right last topic before we head off into the sunlight um who won the match both of them. I mean, both of them won the match, obviously, because they went on to have bigger and better careers from this particular match. But... I mean, not so much as just that. They went on to have great careers, obviously. But like RVD and Jerry, the impact of those two guys, the fact that their move sets and the things that they did and everything are still used to this day. People are using it like, like it's something that is a necessity, not so much as just a move that somebody can, you know, learn for their own uniqueness or what. Their move set basically became natural, like natural move sets in the sport of professional wrestling. So, if if anyone really won, yeah, these both of these guys actually won the whole thing because the legacy of what they did in the ring lives on forever. I've always had this thing where I was talk about some of the best songs in the world that have been written, probably haven't been heard by many people because they didn't have the platform. Mm -hmm. I look at that like as a Jerry Lynn, where this guy, he was doing stuff and innovation and just crazy, crazy uh, wrestling move sets and spots. And if he if he had had an AEW or if he would if he was if he was healthy now if the, if this guy was doing stuff right now, he would be you know he'd be Will Ospreay esque like just just legendary maybe not but unfortunately his body broke down before he had a chance to when everything started rolling with this kind of style. RVD was able to kind of you know he stayed a little healthier probably all the green, and you know still wrestling, you know quote unquote. But, uh, you know, Jerry Lynn's completely in backstage now because he just, his body's so beat up because he basically sacrificed himself for this kind of, in this style. And these guys like Ricochet and, you know, all these guys, they owe him for really, uh, you know, setting, setting the table with this kind of wrestling that we see now. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I think if you're looking at monetarily or popularity-wise, RVD had the better, the better career. You know, maybe we more money because he spent longer time in WWE and, and some bigger promotions. But yeah, you're they both they both deserve a pat on the back for for this just being a benchmark match. You know, in the in wrestling and especially a launching pad or or this season of wrestling, but for a launching pad, what we see now and enjoy now. You know, absolutely. Let's say whistle sales won this match. Hello, <laughs> whistle sales were sold. Oh, this was oh my God! I bet Bill Alfonso has a stand oh, outside the building. It's like, hey, you want a whistle? You want a whistle, guys? I'm gonna be hearing that just for no reason now. Just yeah. People are whistling now. Nightmares. Well, is it Bill? Is he around? <laughs> I don't know if ECW won the match particular because they went out of business a couple years later. So this obviously didn't do anything. Well. If you look at it, ECW, I guess you could, yeah, they went out of business, but pretty much everyone who worked there went to WWE. Yeah. Yeah. And we're still talking about, we're still talking about them now. Exactly. Anybody who was really kind of worth a damn in ECW went on into WWE. It kind of melded in together. Mm -hmm. The, the, and, I mean, and WWE even used it. EC, they even had that third brand. It, definitely was a shell of its former self you know but you know i think ecw you can call it bankrupt going out of business that's kind of a bad mark sure but in the long run the legacy of ecw lives on forever and it always they will all anything something remotely hardcore happens yes ecw ec to every single time you know anytime um, Paul Heyman goes out. What's one of the first things people associate him with? ECW. You know, so it's just kind of it, it, ECW in the long run 
for sure won this match. For sure. When, when Paul Heyman enters the Hall of Fame, will he be recognized more for his ECW um, run or his Brock Lesnar run? Because right now, it's his Brock Lesnar run is pretty strong. He might go down as one of the – he might go down as the greatest manager since uh, – Bobby, Bobby Heenan. Heenan. Yeah. Yeah. Greatest man. Absolutely. For sure. He's right there with him. I mean, yeah. they're, I, I, I think, and that's what a great, I mean, wow. What a great, what great company to be in. Yeah. With Bob, you consider I, Bobby Heenan. I think for sure when they put Paul Heyman in the WWE Hall of Fame, when they look back on his career, he's, he not only was great manager, like, you know, Bobby Heenan comparisons, but, promoter yep. you know what he did for ec the things that he did for smackdown and raw you know creative wise you know just the things that this man's brain comes up with he's a genius he's a pro yeah. wrestling genius you know, so that that is what they're gonna look at paul Heyman. when paul Heyman's, you know buried in the ground and he's in the hall of fame and people are remembering him they're gonna remember paul paul Heyman is you know, one of the, if not the greatest professional mind in pro, pro wrestling history, I think. Yeah. Uh oh. I think Mick Pro's. Yeah. There he is. Okay. Go ahead. Do it. Say it again. When RVD enters Hall of Fame. Okay. My internet connection is unstable for some reason. Okay. When Harvey D enters the Hall of Fame, will Jerry Lynn induct him? That would be great. I think it would be cool. Will it happen? No. But will it be cool? Hell yeah. That would be great. I think Harvey Paul D would love to have it that way if he could choose. Maybe him or Paul Heyman. Either yeah. one. Is there anyone else that has, had a, has meshed their career with RVD? Maybe Sabu. Could Sabu give a, a, a speech? He can't talk. <laughs> got Bob got Bob, Bob Wire in his mouth. With the Dudleys? I don't know who would talk for RVD at a Hall of Fame. Jerry Lynn or Paul Heyman. Those are the only two guys that could talk him up to hype. Yeah, up absolutely. Him. Tommy Dreamer? Mm. Raven? No. No. Uh, either Jerry Lynn, Paul Heyman. Either of those yeah. two. One of those two guys. Would Jerry Lynn have RVD induct him into the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame? Mm. Oh, well. Anyway. You got anything else? That's all. Those are all my categories, sir. <laughs> Take us home, JP. We got we got to come up with an outro for the for the rematch, but we'll figure that out. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys for joining us. This was episode twenty of the Ring Psychology Podcast, first episode that's going to be going up on YouTube. But we are at twenty, going to keep it going, getting better, possibly putting this into two different uh, like one's going to be a spinoff of the Ring Psychology. We're probably going to make the rematch into a spinoff. That Heck yeah! We can give it the amount of time that it pretty much deserves. Um, but other than that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for listening. Go YouTube, Grenade Bros Productions. You guys find it there. Find that Facebook, same name, Instagram, all under the same umbrella, Grenade Bros Production. For myself, for Bill the Thrill. For swole troll Nick. <laughs> swole troll Nick. The swole troll. T-shirts be coming soon. <laughs> we will see you guys next week. Later. Read this book. <laughs>